everybody, and happy Tuesday. Happy Thanksgiving week, Tuesday. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, I've got a warm beverage, and I, I hope you do as well, or something else equally comforting, because we've got um, all kinds of cool things to talk about this evening. <clears throat> um, I just sent the, the Zoom invite out a few minutes ago, uh, because I'd spent a lot of time looking at our newest uh, donation. <clears throat> I always love it. You know, working here uh, at uh, Good Natured World Headquarters, attached to the marketing department uh, here at the Park District. Um, I love the looks on the faces of my coworkers when something comes in in a, a Ziploc bag or a grocery bag <laughs> um, <laughs> with, with my name on it. Um, cause they know it's, it's, um, going to be something unlike they've ever seen before. And here it is. Um, this is a woodcock that, um, must've made a bad decision, uh, on its migration South. Um, this isn't the first time I've gotten a woodcock in the fall. Um, there was one that, uh, came to us a few years ago from, uh, a, uh, uh, high rise in Chicago. Um, and it's, it, I tell you, these are such cool birds uh, when they're alive, but I'm hoping some of it will translate uh, to even, you know, when they're not alive anymore, that you can appreciate what um, a creature like this, um, uh, you know, what they're here for, what they do, and uh, what we can learn from them. So woodcocks, you know, usually when we talk about American woodcocks, it's in the uh, late winter and early spring, because that's when the male uh, performs uh, what Aldo Leopold wrote about as the sky dance. It's a, a courtship ritual that these birds do, where they, uh, the male um, has a sort of a, a performance ground that he uses to uh, display for a female where he flies up, uh, I've heard as high as 200 feet in the air uh, and then uh, circles his way downward making uh, little twittering sounds. Um, I believe that's through the wings, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, the uh, um, uh, bird, itself lives in uh, in wetlands. We tend to um, uh, hear about them, as I said, in late winter and early spring, when places like Hickory Knolls or King County Audubon uh, will head out on walks to go and try and witness the, the sky dance. So, so here we are in fall. I, I don't know um, exactly you know, where this bird started its migration south, if it was uh, a local bird. Uh, I will tell you it was found in Batavia. It was not found anywhere near a window. It appeared as though it just kind of smacked into the side of a building. Now, how does that happen? Um, I don't know. Um, were there foggy conditions? Was the bird disoriented to start with? Um, maybe it uh, was frightened by a predator? Uh, no idea. But um, here it is, and I wanted to take the opportunity to just point out <laughs> a few things. Now, it has been in the freezer. I thought I set it out long enough ago that it thawed out, um, but eh, still a little stiff. Um, Woodcocks have enormous eyes. Uh, you can kind of see here, this eye, it, it's kind of clear, there we go. Uh, much of the skull um, is the eyes. This is a bird that has almost 360 degree view, which is a good thing. Um, one for um, when it is going through its, its uh, mating and, and uh, courtship ritual so they can see each other, but two, so they can keep a, a lookout for predators. This is a bird that spends a lot of time on the ground. Uh, they nest on the ground, they feed on the ground, uh, being able to see what might be coming towards them from up in the air uh, is uh, going to be a huge advantage. So they've got these big eyes and because they have big eyes, the, everything else in their head has had to shift around to make room for it. Um, 
uh, their, their brain is basically upside down at the back of the skull. Um, and their ears, you know, I was trying to see if I could get it thawed enough and feel around enough. I'm, I'm feeling a little dimple right here and here. The ears are below the eyes. Um, again, some of that has to do with, uh, what did I find in here? I was hoping I could get the, uh, hoping I could get the, <clears throat> the feathers to spread open enough that you could actually see the ear opening. And I might almost have it here. Um, yeah. You can kind of see where I'm pointing it. Uh, one, th th that's uh, because of the, the eyes being so huge, but two, uh, there's a, a lot of uh, uh, birding experts who believe that those ears are also used to uh, help sense the bird's prey, which uh, is uh, consists of invertebrates in the soil. Now they they do eat some plant material too, but this long uh, this long bill is used to probe down into the soil, and uh, there's actually a lot of uh, nerves, uh, there's a lot of sensory capabilities at the end of this bill. Because frankly, <laughs> it's so big, they can't see the end of it. So, um, you know, they go around and they uh, they poke into the soil um, and they can feel, I've even heard that they can sense uh, the mucus of a worm uh, trail underneath the ground. And that's a, you know, that's a pretty deep reach that they have there. That's uh, what, three inches or more? They go all the way down. Uh, so it's, it's no wonder they need to migrate um, to find, this isn't a, a bill that's going to adapt readily to you know, switching from eating invertebrates in the soil to say, you know, plucking berries off of a tree. But um, they, so they'll need to go uh, far enough south where they can get to grounds that are, are unfrozen so that they can continue to feed. Uh, but it's not a, a terribly long journey and they do come back, uh, like I said, late uh, winter and uh, early spring. Now I do have uh, a photo I wanted to share with you too. So let's, uh, let's get our screen share started. Um, the woodcocks, you know, they are, um, they're in this, area, I, I wouldn't say that they are, uh, they're rare, but you have to know where to look in order to find them. Um, I mentioned that they're birds of the uh, uh, generally of wet areas. Here we go. Okay, hopefully everybody's seeing a woodcock there, a family of woodcocks. Um, this was uh, sent in by a uh, a, a couple that lives out near Johnson's Mound Forest Preserve, I, actually uh, Hughes Creek Golf Course is where uh, their home uh, abuts up to. And um, it wasn't until they put a, a naturalized buffer where they started using native plants as part of their landscaping um, that they started having woodcocks. So that was a, a real exciting um, uh, development for them and something that they certainly enjoyed. Um, this uh, shows the mom with the uh, the four chicks. This was, uh, I'm going to say, I don't know, two, three years ago that this picture dates back to. But um, yeah, they, they, uh, they are in our area. Uh, and, and you can spot them you know, beyond uh, the, uh, the courtship phase. Um, the, again, the, the times I found woodcocks in, say, oh, you know, June, July, and August, it's been completely unexpected, and I've almost stepped on them. It's been when I've been walking in, in marshy areas. Um, <clears throat> there's a low-lying area for local folks. Um, there's a low-lying area over uh, by, I don't know if they would call that Leroy Oaks, or if it would be uh, connected to the Great Western Trail, but it's it's not too far from the the parking for the Great Western Trailhead. That's that's by uh, Leroy Oaks, um, and there's some some uh, marshy wetters. I was actually looking uh, to see if there were any, um, but sort of amphibians might be down there. Here's this woodcock just sitting there quietly. 
Uh, well, it was quiet until I almost stepped on it and then it, it burst away, it flew up in my face, scared the heck out of me. But um, anyway, they, they are around, um, they are uh, unfortunately sometimes victims uh, of uh, wrong turns, bad decisions during, uh, during migration. Uh, but super cool birds, keep them in mind because even though it's, uh, it's November now, it's only a few short months uh, until we get to uh, in February, beginning of March, and uh, woodcock uh, courtship season will be starting. So anyway, just wanted to share that while it was still kind of fresh. Um, I'll put it back here in uh, its bag, and it can uh, go back in the freezer. So we want to talk about woodcocks again. Now, um, you know, I'm going to stop this share for a second because I had another object. Um, remember, was it was it just last week or was it two weeks ago that uh, we had those photos sent to us of the weird um, object that looked, uh, the, the finder sort of thought it looked like a skull, you know, with these being the, uh, the eye sockets here. Um, but then he turned it over and he saw what looks like a spinal column. So I'm still leaning towards the, the, the pelvis of some sort of water bird in the, uh, the nearest one I've been able to find so far is the uh, uh, double-crested cormorant. I haven't come down completely in favor of that, but it's um, uh, still I, such a, interesting and I wish you could feel it too you know um bird bones as opposed to uh say mammal bones like here just happen to have a deer bone on the desk um there's a lot of heft to this um it's it's solid um and it it, it you know mammals they don't fly uh they are um you know pretty terrestrial uh, unless they're Santa's deer, <laughs> that's a whole different sort of thing. But they um, um, are heavy. This, my gosh, I, I'd hate to say light as a feather, uh, but but they kind of are. Um, bird bones. There's a, a matrix inside that's really designed to um, be as lightweight as possible while still providing the structure that's necessary <laughs> for the bone. So. Um, just wanted to kind of give you guys a 360 of this. And if any of you are bird anatomy experts and want to weigh in with other opinions, I would greatly appreciate hearing from you. All right. Okay, let's go back to, uh, to our slides for tonight. Yes, the woodcock uh, and oyster catchers, um, they are really, no, they've, they've got, um, I always think of them as a, like being shaped like a sweet potato. And I think the um, yellowish tone or uh, orangish tone to the breast too, just always makes me think sweet potato. <laughs> uh, but they are uh, related to sandpipers and other shorebirds. So let's see where you get that connection. And the, the oyster catcher he has that, that uh, bill too. I think it's a probing bill, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah. Well, let's see. Um, I got uh, our share back here. Um, here's that look uh, again of the, uh, the skeleton that we looked at last week and um, kind of thinking there's some relationship here in the middle. Here's where the, the legs pop out. I also think, um, I'm not sure if this is a complete structure or not, if this might have been um, you know, somewhat compromises. Maybe there's some parts that are missing. Fortunately, this was the only, the finder said this was the only bone that was there. Uh, there wasn't anything else, uh, no, no legs, which would have helped some and uh, no skull, which would have helped immensely <laughs> in trying to sort this out. But anyway, for now, uh, we're leaning towards Cormorant, but um, still a bit of a mystery. 
All right. So completely different subject area and one I have to say I'm not super well versed in, but uh, this tree caught my eye. So a uh, week or two ago, we were talking about the, uh, the stinkhorn mushrooms that had popped up at uh, what was Belgium Town Park here in St. Charles. And Belgium Town, you know, it's, um, it's uh, one of our newer parks. Uh, it was added within the last, say, five to 10 years. And um, its name is a, a nod to the, uh, the Belgians who worked in uh, the factories uh, in that part of town. Um, and the, uh, the park itself, it's, it's not huge. It has a pickleball court, it has playground, it has stinkhorn mushrooms. So I, I, I went there, you know, a few different times because I was so fascinated by uh, what was going on uh, with the the uh, fungi there growing in the playground. And then I um, I took a little walk around the path. Um, I was actually looking for something to put some of those stinkhorn eggs in, the devil's eggs that the stinkhorns were going to write. I thought, surely there's some trash here. There really wasn't. Our parks guys do a great job of keeping our parks clean, but I, I did find uh, tossed way far away, there was a Starbucks cup. So as I was walking over to get that so I could collect the stinkhorn eggs, I happened to look up and the structure of this tree just really grabbed my eye. Um, it's a specimen tree of sorts. I don't know uh, who planted it or when it was planted. I, it's not usually um, something that the park district. It's not really something that um, yeah, we would choose to put in a park. And it looks like it's been there. Its presence is, predates to when that was a park. But um, look at the curls on the remaining leaves on this tree. And then if we take a slightly farther uh, look uh, away, we see the branches continue that curling form. And uh, the, the next um, thought that sprang to mind was corkscrew willow. Um, if you can see, let's see if we can zoom in on some of these leaves here. Uh, they looked a little bit like seed pods at first. And then I looked closer. I'm like, no, these are leaves. And they are that long um, uh, shape. Uh, if they were not curled up, you could see the, the willow form of the shape of the leaf. Uh, and just like these really cool, it looks like something you would see in a, in a floral arrangement, the way these branches twist and turn. And then if we go here to the next picture, uh, you can see that that, that twisting nature um, continues throughout the tree. Uh, if we zoom in down below here, um, there's the uh, somewhat striated uh, bark uh, of the willow. Um, so I wondered, is, do we have corkscrew tree uh, or um, curly willow was another word I've heard used. And I thought, is this, is this a native tree? And it turns out it's not. Um, I believe this is Salix. Uh, which is the genus for willows, um, Matsudena. Um, so it's, it's Asian in origin. And um, I, I wasn't able to, to find out anything in our park district records of, of where it came to be. I, I, and I think it was something that was there when we acquired the property. But it, it's super cool. And it's something um, I know of one uh, or two yards around town that have planted smaller, like more shrubby versions of corkscrew willows just as a, as a specimen tree in the front yard. Um, this tree was actually pretty tall. It wasn't enormous. And you can tell the branches, you know, they're not super thick. Um, I'm guessing this tree uh, and being a willow, it you know could have grown this fast in maybe 15 or 20 years. But um, it, it, um, it really added um, an interesting note to the landscape. If we go back I think over here you can kind of see there's there's a lot of uh, this is not a park that has any um, areas that have been designated as natural areas so uh, there's not uh, any heritage oaks there or um, I, I think we did uh, put a few native plantings in 
uh, when we developed uh, the area where the playground is, but it's it's pretty much a, a park with a playground, a pickleball court, small parking lot, um, and as it turns out, this cool curly willow. Something neat to see. Now, um, this next couple of slides here, I, I took these. So we we were um, lucky enough to partner with King County Audubon. Uh, See, this would have been a week ago last Saturday. We hosted uh, an owl prowl with the uh, the Young Birders Club. So uh, Tim from King County Audubon has developed this nice following of families uh, who have an interest in uh, the outdoors and in birding. And uh, so we went out for a, a hike at Hickory Knolls um, uh, shortly after it got dark. In fact, there was a little bit of snow in the air. It was it was kind of a, a neat feeling to be out there. It was very, very quiet. And it was very, very dark, except for here. I could not believe, now I have not been, I don't know how many of you have, have uh, attended uh, night uh, programs at Hickory Knolls. I haven't been at one in a while. I have not led one in a while. And I could not believe how bright the lights are now uh, coming from the Illinois Youth Corrections Facility. Um, there was uh, uh, some additions put on there. Um, different, there, there's actually two different tiers of, of lights now and they um, really lighted up like that. We were actually squinting as we were standing there. The reason we were over in this part of the, uh, the park and this is, uh, Again, if you're local and you're familiar with the uh, Hickory Knolls uh, natural area, this is um, uh, on the southern part. Uh, this, this would be the southeast part of the natural area. What we were doing was looking towards the trees that have the heron nest in them. Uh, we see uh, from, it's not a for sure thing, but uh, more than a couple of times over the past 10 years, we've had great horned owls select a uh, heron nest to uh, raise their brood in. Uh, great horned owls, in fact, most owls, they don't uh, use their own energy and resources to build a nest. They find something else to nest in, whether it's an existing nest. Great horned owls um, will pick heron nests. They love red-tailed hawk nests. Um, sometimes they'll find a nice a snag, a, a broken off oak tree in the woods. But these guys, they don't, uh, they don't spend time uh, building an elaborate nest of their own because there's so many out there not being used because uh, these are animals, uh, these are birds that are presently uh, moving into the, the courtship phase of their annual life cycle. They're gonna be laying eggs once we get into the new year. Um, oftentimes by the end of February, they've got um, nestlings. The, the eggs have already hatched and they're well on their way to being raised. We get into April and the young are fledging already. So they are very, I believe they're, they are our earliest breeders. So going out to listen um, to the, uh, for the adult birds calling back and forth, this was a good time and it, it continues to be a good time. I know in my neighborhood, I've been hearing them calling now for probably a, at least a couple of weeks. And um, they uh, 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 are, this was a, a likely area to hear them. I don't know the effect of these bright lights on owl courtship. This just seemed, you know, it looks like daylight there, but for the fact that the woods behind them are dark, um, it looks like broad daylight. Now, um, I'm gonna play this. So this, by contrast, this was, um, Let's just play this right at the beginning. This was um, this past Friday evening. And it was right at the beginning here. I just caught a little bit of it. Uh, this is not the Hickory Knolls natural area. This is um, Fabian Forest Preserve. And Fabian, you might recall, uh, and longtime area residents, you, you might recall the, the first famous 
Geneva owls. Those were the owls that nested uh, by the courthouse on Third Street in downtown Geneva. That went on for, I want to say, four or five, six years, something in that range. Um, right about the time I started here at uh, at St. Charles in 2007. Um, and they would always choose a, a nest, an existing nest in a tree. It was usually a squirrel nest. And I remember there was always kind of some concern uh, amongst all of us owl watchers on would the nest last until the owls fledged or not. Uh, the baby owls, especially as they get bigger and bigger and they start flexing their wings and doing that branching where they're you know, getting out and about uh, near their nest. Uh, a squirrel nest wasn't really made to <laughs> for that sort of use. But anyway, um, the uh, uh, Geneva courthouse owls, uh, they, I don't know, aged out of their breeding uh, times. What are, they, they disappeared. Uh, but shortly after that, there were owls breeding at Fabian Forest Preserve, which is, oh gosh, a mile or less south of the Geneva courthouse. So there's been thought all along that these are some perhaps related to those uh, courthouse owls. Maybe their progeny have moved down river. Um, so in, in fact, for several years, the uh, there was a uh, broken off oak tree right next to a picnic shelter and the owls would nest there every year. Again, we're talking about great horn owls. Um, well, this past year, the owls at Fabian, there was, there was a uh, kind of a tragedy of sorts. Um, the parents died. Uh, the female was taken um, in poor condition to a local uh, rehab facility. The folks up at CARE, the Kane Area uh, Rehabilitation and Education uh, for Wildlife Group up in, in the Valley View neighborhood. Uh, they took in the female and uh, she did not survive um, there was a lot of speculation that was right at the height of the avian flu scare in, uh, I want to say that was May of this, this current year. And um, so they were thinking maybe she had avian flu. Uh, there's also whenever you find a, a dead uh, or dying raptor, there's always a concern that they've consumed rodents that have eaten uh, rodenticides, uh, you know, mouse baits, rat baits. Um, and uh, that can cause all kinds of problems up to and, and including death. Uh, but it turns out it was neither of those. It was just a massive infection. Um, the offspring too, there were two owlets that were in the uh, care of those parents too. And uh, I believe the male of uh, that um, that family, the, the, the male owlet did not survive, but the female did. I don't know. Um, where she was released yet, but there were most definitely two owls hooting up a storm the other night at Fabian Forest Preserve. So those of you who are um, into owls and um, are looking, if you, if you don't hear them in your own neighborhood, and you could very well, um, again, they are, uh, they are very successful species in this area, the Great Horns, and um, pretty much every uh, neighborhood. If, you've, if there's plentiful food, if there's rabbits, if there's voles, if there's skunks, um, any of those things could be menu items for a great horned owl. And if, if those are present, chances are that owls are too. Um, again, my neighborhood isn't particularly wild at all. It's um, very suburban with, um, you know, we don't have a, an oak canopy. It's, you know, a lot of Norway maples and box elders. Um, the schoolyard is wide open. Uh, and yet every year there are owls uh, that uh, nest in the, the old pine tree. They were up on the Geneva water tower a couple of years ago. Um, they make a good living uh, with the, uh, the animals they find right in our own backyards. But uh, keep your eyes open, keep your ears open, um, because it is great horned owl nesting season.
Oh, shoot. There were some other slides that were supposed to be here. Um, I was going to wrap up with this, but since it's here, uh, Laura, you and I were just talking about this earlier, and I wanted to make some clarifications. This is um, uh, this is the event that uh, we talked about before. It is uh, produced by, well, it's a, the brainchild of the Next Gen Advisory Council uh, of the Conservation Foundation. Um, it's just a, a reason to get together people who uh, love our local environment and uh, want to talk to other people who are equally involved and uh, maybe learn a thing or two, have a few laughs. Uh, it's uh, the Next Gen uh, Council is made up of Conservation Foundation members who are 40 or younger, but the events they produce are open to all ages. So don't let um, their age <laughs> keep you away if you happen to not be of that age. I know uh, I will be there uh, looking forward to it. That's the night that we'll be skipping uh, Good Natured uh, so that we can go ahead and um, celebrate in person down at uh, Two Brothers Roundhouse, formerly Walter Payton's Roundhouse uh, in Aurora. Okay, now I got to figure out what I did with those other slides. Um, in the meantime here, let's see, Anne had a chat. Uh, last week we had a green hornet hooting occasionally like uh, one would expect, but then it would just hoot continuously for a couple of minutes. You know, and that's, these guys were kind of mixing it up too. There was, so the, the typical, I'm gonna give this uh, uh, great horned owl, um, let's stop the share here. Um, it, so a great horned owl has a kind of a, <laughs> it's sort of the basic uh, rhythm or pattern of what their calls would be. And of course the, the male is the smaller bird, but it has the deeper voice. And the female is the larger bird, uh, bird, but she has the higher voice. And uh, when you listen to them duetting, you can actually tell who is who. Um, they might move around a little bit. But yeah, um, these Fabian owls, that, that quick little uh, recording that I got, that was part of a just a hoo, 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 hoo. So I don't know if they were reacting to my presence there or if there was something else that they were excited about. Um, but, you know, I'm glad we're, we're talking about vocalizations. Um, there was something I wanted to add about the, the owl uh, prowl that we did at the Nature Center. I got in too much of a tear about the bright lights. I forgot to mention, um, we did hear some owls on our walk. We heard, um, as we went deeper into the park, we did hear to the north uh, an owl, a, a great horn uh, adult hooting. Didn't hear a response, but it was kind of faint. And I almost think the owl might have been across Campton Hills Road in the, the neighborhood to the north of the nature center. But then as we came back, um, there was a, a really interesting sound coming from inside the, the prison. Oh, that sounds bad. <laughs> All right, an interesting bird sound coming from inside the fence. <laughs> that sounds better. Uh, it was something in a tree that was making a sound that uh, was kind of cat-like, but it, it, when I first heard it, um, my mind went to uh, an immature great horned owl. They are still, even though they are, their parents are, are done raising them they the birds they, they fledge in April sometimes as late as early May but the parents will continue to feed them throughout the summer but as summer draws to a close the parents cut them off because the last thing the parents want are the offspring hanging around when it's time to get back uh, into breeding mode again they need to clear their territory they need to save all the resources for themselves so those youngsters have to get a move on but um, frequently there'll be a hanger, hanger on that does not want to leave, um, and will continue to beg. So when we heard this, this call from inside, uh, the, uh, the fence, I just figured it was, uh, 
the uh, the sound of an immature. Well, uh, one of the uh, the program attendees got uh, got her cell phone out, got her Merlin app open, and Merlin has this feature. Let's see if I can pull mine up here. Um, Merlin is uh, put out by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and it's a great um, aid in identifying uh, what it is that you are seeing or hearing. So here, Merlin app, and you can start bird ID. That uh, takes you down through a lot of questions uh, that will help you decide what it is you're looking at. But then they've also got sound ID. Um, and I'm going to see, did I record what we were listening to? Let me see if this will play for us. Um, all right, if you heard that little hoo-hoo, I think that was one of the young birders. <laughs> imitating the sound. Anyway, point is, um, my Merlin said it had no matches for what it was hearing, but another participant's Merlin said it was the call of a long-eared owl. Now, um, that triggered a, a sort of a chain of excitement. Um, let me see if while we're talking here, I can pull up a long-eared owl. Um, Long-eared owls, they're one of uh, a handful of species of owls that come to Northern Illinois to spend uh, the winter. Um, they, uh, I don't know that I've ever not seen one or seen one in anything. Let's see, how do I wanna say this? They gravitate towards conifers, pine trees. Uh, I remember when I worked at Red Oak, my, my old boss, Jim, uh, was uncharacteristically late for work one morning because as he was backing out of his driveway, he looked up in his neighbor's spruce tree and there were three long-eared owls staring down at him. Uh, they do tend to gather in groups when they're down here. Um, let's see if I can uh, open this up here. We're going to go to uh, All About Birds, our favorite online bird guide. Um, and uh, I'll share this photo with you here. Uh, but um, anyway, uh, Tim from from uh, Audubon and I we started um, talking about. So here's our long-eared owl. Looks superficially um, like a great horned owl, but uh, see there's a lot more white on the breast. This, this face um, is different. Um, these facial discs uh, are a little bit higher up and the ear uh, feather tufts that look like ears um, and have given this bird its name. Uh, are different as well. I could pull up a, a, a great horn picture too, so we can compare them, but um, long-eared owls don't typically vocalize when they're down here. This isn't a time that they would be breeding. And um, the, the way the repetitive nature of the call that we were hearing just really had me convinced that it was a, uh, a young, uh, great, a very young, young and very persistent great horned owl that was repeatedly begging uh, for mom uh, or dad to bring in a snack, maybe just one more time. Uh, Long-eared owls, um, be on the lookout for them. We did have a, a flush of cold weather last week and that usually starts to bring them down. But uh, when I've seen them down here for, it's always been uh, on cold January days, and much like this, they'd be tucked up inside uh, a conifer, uh, which is their familiar uh, vegetation since they're birds of the north. Um, let me see here. I'll just do 
all about birds. No, not all about cats. All about birds. That one, great horn. Um, let's take a, uh, we're going to compare these here briefly so you can see the differences between the two. Um, our photo gallery. Okay. Great horned, long-eared. Great horn, long-eared. Now, great horns, um, they are our largest owls in this area. Um, they're, they're, they look bulky. Uh, a lot of that bulk is feathers. I, I think great horn owls weigh something like three pounds. So they're a, a poofy bulk. Uh, the, uh, uh, the silhouette of a long-eared owl is often uh, looks uh, much more slender in comparison. Um, did they give us any other ones here to look at? What's this one? Oh, that's a fledgling. Wow. <laughs> I'd like to have that staring at you. Um, uh, here we go. Here, let's see if I can get this one up. This is the this is the what I consider a uh, kind of a classic outline silhouette of a long-eared owl. I think they do this to help um, improve their camouflage when they're sitting in a tree. Oftentimes, they'll be tucked up close to um, the trunk of the tree, and that an elongated um, shape or profile helps them blend in more. Uh, those markings too will uh, help uh, uh, mimic or camouflage themselves against uh, the uh, sap, the white pine sap that drips on the tree and the white uh, snow that's on the tree. These guys, yeah, they're, they're quite uh, bulky in shape. Here's another view of one. So, um, Notice where the uh, the tufts on the head are here and the way the facial dish is shaped. Boy, this picture looks a little compressed. Let's see, let's try this one any better. Where's our original one? Here's one on a nest. But um, anyway, um, lots of all activity. This is a great time to head out. Uh, to look for and see them. Those owls that were hooting at, uh, at Fabian, um, they, I think they might've, one might've even been all the way across the river. We were at Fabian West and the way the sound was traveling, it sounded like it was coming over the water, but still very, um, very easy to hear uh, the birds calling back and forth and moving slightly from position to position. So I bet you we're gonna get another owl nest there um, come say January or so, be cool to see, see what, uh, ends up happening there. All right. I will stop this share. And, um, it's only 845, but that's about all I had for tonight, folks. Does, does anybody have anything else they'd, uh, they'd like to share with, uh, for the good of the group? If not, and it's Thanksgiving week, so you might have uh, other preparations that you need to get to. I uh, really appreciate you hanging out with us for a while, and um, you can count on more good nature next week. I'll see you then. Have a great, uh, have a great holiday. Take care. Thanks. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Pam. Happy, Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Pam. Pam. Happy we'll day next week. Bye bye. Thanks, Pam. Thank you, Pam. <laughs> Finally got it on mute. <laughs>